Hello everyone, I'm Ursula Gontier and I work in the Publishing and Technology Directorate here at Cochrane. Cochrane welcomes proposals for new and updated reviews and proposals are assessed by topic experts who will consider whether your proposed review asks an important question suitable for a Cochrane review. Um, I'm here today with our evidence synthesis development editors, Lindsay Robertson and Leslie Choi, who are experts in review development and support authors developing reviews. And they're going to tell us a bit more about what makes a good review question. So Lindsay, can you tell us what makes a good review question for an author who's proposing a new review? So a good review question should be answerable, it should fill in the gaps in the knowledge, and it should address issues that are important to stakeholders. So to formulate a good review question, you should really apply the finer criteria as they encapsulate the key issues of a systematic review. Finer stands for feasible, interesting, novel, ethical and relevant. In terms of feasibility, you want a question that the author team is capable of answering using the evidence available. A narrow focus question will help stop the scope becoming too broad. If you have several review questions, the temptation can often be to include them in one review. Uh, we would advise you not to do this, but to start with one review and build on what you find. It's better to do multiple reviews, each answering a narrow focus question rather than one large broad review. In terms of interesting, a systematic review is a big undertaking that takes a lot of time and commitment. So you want the authors in the team to be interested in the, in the question. In terms of the review being novel, you want the question to answer a genuine gap in the knowledge and you want to avoid overlap with any other reviews. We would advise that you check for pre-existing systematic reviews and ongoing systematic reviews on the topic before you set your question. In terms of ethical issues to be considered, they include the priority of the question and how it's framed. And in terms of relevance, you want the question to support clinical practice and quality and policy. So you want to consider patients, health professionals and policymakers. We would strongly advise that it's worth spending time on ensuring you've got a good review question as it guides so many aspects of the review process. <laughs> if you can imagine what your finished review looks like and work back from there, that can often be helpful. Thanks very much, Lindsay. Um, and Leslie, what do you think prospective authors should take into account when discuss deciding on the scope of the review? Sure. Uh, thanks for that question, Ursula, and also what you've just outlined, Lindsay, because the question formulation is very important at this stage of um, review development in um, restricting your scope or expanding the scope. So firstly, what do we mean by scope? So I'm a biologist at heart. So when I um, think of scope, I used, like to use the example of thinking about casting a fishing net um, into the sea and trying to get an accurate picture of um, what kind of fish are in that sea. Obviously, if you have too large a net, then um, depending on, on your boat size, you might capsize it. Um, and too narrow, you might not get that ac accurate picture of what's going on in, in, in the ocean. So I'm going to be discussing specifics to intervention reviews, but general principles are applicable to all review types. So this particular point, the inclusion criteria is very important in, in how you construct the scope of the review. So in, in inclusion criteria, we have uh, the types of studies and also the uh, PICO, which is the participants intervention comparative outcomes. And then we move on to the PICO criteria. So um, firstly, the participants. So for participants, think about how the disease and condition is defined and what are the import most important characteristics that describe these uh, participants, including relevant demographic factors such as age, sex and ethnicity, and what the setting is um, for the participants. In terms of interventions, again, uh, make sure they're clearly defined as well, and what the uh, experimental and comparator interventions of interest are. Um, these should be included in your review question already. And then finally, for outcomes, 
Now, for outcomes, there's no hard limit on the number of outcomes uh, that you should include in the review, but make sure they are relevant for end users. These are clinicians, patients, and guideline developers. And also ensure that you have outcomes that reflect both the benefits and harms of the intervention, as this is mandatory for Cochrane reviews. And again, as I've um, uh, stated for the other aspects of the inclusion criteria, make sure there's clear definition of the outcomes. So what are the important time points? Um, and also if you're using the outcomes that have uh, internationally recognized uh, scales, uh, state what the hierarchy of scales is in your review. And at the end of the day, uh, make sure that um, your inclusion criteria is relevant to the uh, research question that you've formulated. And moving ahead, one thing that this really helps with scope with the inclusion criteria is thinking about what um, comparators and what analyses you might do uh, when you actually come to conduct the review and state this in the uh, protocol stage. Thanks very much, Leslie. Um, I think prospective authors proposing new reviews will find this advice really useful. So thanks very much. Um, if you do have any questions about proposing a new review or about review development, then please don't hesitate to contact the Cochrane support team on support at cochrane.org.